Book of Mormon People, Ruins, and Artifacts here in the United States. I became interested in this subject in 2013 and have been learning about it ever since. And there's so much I could share today and a whole day probably wouldn't even be enough time. But what I am going to share, I've condensed down so we can speed through. But feel free to stop the video to look at any slides or read any slides that you want to. So, in the Book of Mormon, it all ends around the Hill Cumorah. But in the latter days, it all begins around the Hill Cumorah. Today I'm going to share some things that I believe support the truth of the Book of Mormon. Some of it's just information, ideas, and opinions, and isn't anything to base your testimony of the Book of Mormon off of. That can only come from the Holy Ghost. But it's interesting, and I do enjoy learning about the descendants of Lehi, many of whom live right here among us on the land currently called the United States of America which is the mighty nation of Gentiles prophesied of in the Book of Mormon and is the land where the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored and is the land where the New Jerusalem will be, all of which is the land that was promised to the descendants of Lehi forever. So first, Book of Mormon people. Who are the descendants of Lehi and where are they at? Well, in a very general sense, the introduction page before the Book of Mormon starts says that the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the American Indians. But the Doctrine and Covenants and church history records give us some more specifics. Does anybody know what the very first official mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was? It was a mission to the Lamanites. The call was given by God in 1830 just six months after the Book of Mormon was published and the Church was created. In Doctrine and Covenants section 28, 30, and 32, the Lord tells Oliver Cowdery, Peter Whitmer Jr., Parley P. Pratt, and Ziba Peterson to go unto the Lamanites and preach my gospel. These are the words of God himself. In these sections, as well as sections 54 and 57, the Lord talks about the borders of the Lamanites and the line running directly between Jew and Gentile, which is also where Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be. So, what borders or line is the Lord talking about? It's the western border of Missouri, for two reasons. One, because that's where Independence, Missouri is, which is the center place for the city of Zion, and two, because in 1830, the western border of Missouri was also the western border of the United States, and on the other side of that border were Indian reservations, where the U.S. was forcing most of the Native Americans from the east to move to. These were the Lamanites whom the Lord wanted the very first mission of his church to go to. And the missionary's message was well received by the Seneca in New York, the Wyandotte in Ohio, and the Delaware beyond Missouri. But the U.S. Indian agents and missionaries of other churches were jealous of our missionaries' success, so they charged them as disturbers of the peace and ordered them to leave the reservations or face military force. And that was the end of the first mission to the Lamanites. So, who are some of these Lamanites on the other side of the border? Here's a list of some of the tribes that I know of who were forced there by the 1830s. We have the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, also known as Muscogee, Delaware, Fox, Iowa, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Otto, Potawatomi, Peoria, Quapaw, Sac, Seminole, Seneca, Shawnee, and Wyandotte. So all three of the tribes that received the gospel message are on that list. There are also three other tribes on that list, the Sac, the Fox, and the Potawatomi, whom Joseph Smith personally spoke with in the 1840s and told them by revelation from God that their forefathers were the people of the Book of Mormon. And then in a more general sense, he also said by revelation from God that these western tribes of Indians were the remnant of the Book of Mormon people. Now, I personally don't believe that it's just coincidence that these tribes just happen to be on the western border from Missouri, where the New Jerusalem will be. In 3 Nephi chapters 20 and 21, and Ether chapter 13, 
Jesus Christ, Ether, and Moroni all talk about how the New Jerusalem will one day be built on their land. And in 3 Nephi chapter 21, Jesus tells the Nephites about the Gentiles who will one day conquer their land, but also that the Book of Mormon and the restored church will come to them through Joseph Smith and the Gentiles who repent, and their land will be restored to them. And here's an interesting detail that I've never noticed until a few years ago. So again, Jesus is talking to the Nephites about the Gentiles, and he says, But if they, talking about the Gentiles, will repent and hearken unto my words, and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. And they shall come in unto the covenant and be numbered among this, the remnant of Jacob. Remember, he's talking to the Nephites here. They are this, the remnant of Jacob. Unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. And they, talking about the Gentiles, shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the New Jerusalem. And then shall they assist my people, that they may be gathered in, who are scattered upon all the face of the land, in unto the New Jerusalem. So did anybody else catch that detail? It's the descendants of Lehi who are going to build the New Jerusalem, and members of the church will come and assist them. Back in Joseph Smith's day, it was a big trial of the church's faith that they didn't get to build the New Jerusalem as they thought they were going to. But all the Lord had them do was dedicate the land, because the New Jerusalem can't be built until the descendants of Lehi realize who they are and come into the restored church. But look at where many of their tribes are today, and look at where the New Jerusalem is going to be. Even though it was a horrible thing how the U.S. forced them onto those reservations, the Lord has a way of turning horrible things into good things, and the Lord has made it so that they're right where they need to be when it comes time to build the New Jerusalem. I think that's cool. Now let's get into some ruins and artifacts. In 1834, Joseph Smith and others left Kirtland, Ohio and walked to Missouri to help members of the church who were being violently persecuted there. This was known as Zion's Camp. On June 4th, Joseph wrote a letter to his wife, Emma, and in it he mentions something very interesting. He says, The whole of our journey in the midst of so large a company of social, honest, and sincere men, wandering over the plains of the Nephites, recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, roving over the mounds of that once beloved people of the Lord, picking up their skulls and their bones as proof of its divine authenticity. So the Book of Mormon mentions how sometimes dead bodies were just heaped up and covered instead of buried underground. There's an ancient race of people who once lived mostly in the eastern half of the United States and Canada who are called the Hopewell Mound Builders. And Zion's camp had been traveling right through some of the most condensed areas of their ruins. I'll talk more about the Mound Builders in a moment, but first, let's get into more detail about the experience that Joseph had briefly mentioned to Emma. So the previous day, on June 3rd, they'd been digging in a mound by the Illinois River and found a large skeleton. Joseph received a revelation from God that it was a righteous Lamanite named Zelph who fought in the last great struggle between the Nephites and Lamanites under the command of a prophet named Onondagus, who was known from the Hill Cumorah or Eastern Sea all the way to the Rocky Mountains. I've been to this mound. It's called the Naples-Russell Mound No. 8 on the west bank of the Illinois River near Griggsville, Illinois. Artifacts excavated from the mound are Hopewell artifacts, roughly estimated between 150 to 350 A.D. And 322 to about 385 A.D. is when the last great wars in the Book of Mormon were. There are three mound builder civilizations that have lived in North America. The first are the Adena, who are estimated to have lived between some time in the 2000s B.C. to the 300s B.C., mostly around the Great Lakes area. The second are the Hopewell, who are estimated to have lived between the 500s B.C. to the 400s A.D., from the Gulf area up to the Great Lakes area. 
and the third are the Mississippian, who are estimated to have lived between the 900s AD to the 1400s AD, or European contact, and lived mostly in the Gulf area, but there are traces of these civilizations throughout the entire continent. These groups are called mound builders not just because of burial mounds, but because they used various types of dirt and gravel to also create their building structures. Sadly, most of these structures have been leveled to the ground as the United States grew further westward, building cities and field crops. But some of them still remain and can be visited. I'm going to focus on the Hopewell Mound Builders today. First of all, Hopewell is an American name. We don't know what these people called themselves. Other native tribes have various names for them, such as the Alagui, the Alagans, the Talagui, the Mundua, the Naholo, and the Asgins. They know the Hopewell were a large nation of lighter-skinned people whom their ancestors destroyed, and most archaeologists are in agreement that the Hopewell civilization ended around 400 AD in New York, and we know from the Book of Mormon that the last major battle by the Hill Cumorah in New York was in 385 AD, and that the survivors from that battle either joined the Lamanites or were hunted over the next few decades. So let's get into Hopewell Forts, which are built exactly how Captain Moroni describes them in the Book of Mormon. They're often built on hilltops. The outer edges of the forts are either naturally steep slopes or large ditches that were dug where the ground was flat or not very steep. The inner edges of the forts are large embankments. At the tops of these embankments were palisade fences made of logs, and every so often there were towers. Now, since all the remains of these forts after so many centuries are the ditches and the embankments, how do archaeologists know about the fences and towers? Well, the logs leave behind what are called post molds. When archaeologists dig down along the tops of these embankments, traces of either rotted or charcoal wood are found where the logs once stood, meaning the wood either rotted away or was burned down. These post molds are a good way to get carbon datings to estimate how old the forts might be, which are almost always within the Hopewell time period. Later, Iroquois tribes also built palisaded forts, but they didn't dig ditches or throw up embankments. That style is unique to the Hopewell. And sometimes their entrances were built pretty strategically to trap enemies who were trying to get in that way. These forts are all over the eastern half of the U.S. There's over 200 forts in western New York alone, but they aren't as grand as the forts further inland, which suggests they may have been built in a hurry. The Palmyra Temple sits right inside one of these forts. Now let's talk about Hopewell Temple sites. These are always by a river and surrounded by a square or rectangular embankment. The temple mounds are always square or rectangular as well, with either two or four ramps going up to the top, just like ramps going up to Hebrew altars according to the Law of Moses, as the Lord describes in Exodus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26. They weren't allowed to build steep steps, because the Hebrews wore skirts back then, and if you're climbing up steep steps, all the people down below can see up your skirt. So they made long, gradual ramps. Here's a spot in Marietta, Ohio, where they had three temple mounds. So this may have been a pretty special spot back in the day. Two of the mounds are still there today. Here's one of them in a park, and if you look really closely, you can see some people standing on top of it to kind of get an idea of how big it is. When I was there, kids were playing a game of football on top of it. And here's another one, with the city library built on top of it. There's another Hopewell Temple site in Iowa, directly across the Mississippi River from Nauvoo, Illinois. The Temple Mound has long since been plowed down, but there's technology that can determine changes in soil and ground compaction and has detected the shape of a rectangular Temple Mound with four ramps that used to be there. And here's something interesting. When you stand at the east embankment and look across the Mississippi River, here's what you see. The Nauvoo Temple. Now let's go to Doctrine and Covenants section 125, 
where the Lord is talking to Joseph Smith about a spot in Iowa, just across from Nauvoo. In verse 3, the Lord says, Let them build up a city unto my name upon the land opposite the city of Nauvoo, and let the name of Zarahemla be named upon it. Now, could this be the Zarahemla from the Book of Mormon? I don't know. The Lord doesn't say. We're just left with a big question mark in our minds. But as far as I'm aware, the Lord has personally only given names to three specific locations in these latter days. One is Zion, the New Jerusalem. Two is Adam on Diamond. And three is Zarahemla. I personally think that's pretty significant that those are the only three places that God himself has given names to in these latter days. And here's something else that's very interesting. The Delaware tribe call the Mississippi River the Namesi Sipu, which means fish river or river of fish. In the Book of Mormon, Zarahemla sat right on the west side of the river Sidon, and the word Sidon is related to fish in Hebrew, Egyptian, Phoenician, and Greek. Anyways, let's move on. Here's a one-of-a-kind mound structure that has some important Hebrew symbols. Notice the nine-candle menorah. Notice the Hebrew oil lamp. And notice the compass and the square, which are ancient sacred symbols in several other cultures and religions, including the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was documented to be about 20 miles east of Milford, Ohio, but was leveled down to the ground by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the early 1900s. There are people who are searching for the site today, but it takes a ton of money to use LIDAR and other technologies to find ancient sites like the way the Iowa Temple site was found. One of the considered locations is this spot in Fayetteville, Ohio, where these ditches form the sacred Hebrew letter Sheen, which may have been where they got the dirt from to build the structure in the first place. All right, now let's get into Hopewell armor and weapons. The Hopewell were experts in making metal armor and weapons, usually out of copper, sometimes out of iron. Ancient copper mines are found in Michigan and Tennessee that date back to the Hopewell and even Adena time periods. I want to start off with head plates. A lot of times in LDS artwork, we'll see Nephites wearing these cool helmets, but not once will you find the word helmet in the Book of Mormon. What you will find is the word head plate, and that's exactly what the Hopewell wore on their heads. Sometimes they had pieces attached to them that came down and covered their ears. Sometimes they were made in interesting designs, perhaps to distinguish ranks. The Hopewell also had arm shields like the Nephites did. They had breastplates like the Nephites did. And these breastplates aren't fancy like what we see in LDS artwork. They're very basic, with holes in them to lace some sort of rope or leather through to fasten them to their bodies. This is about as fancy as they get. This one has pearls attached to it. The Hopewell loved their pearls, and so did the Nephites. Tons of pearls are found in Hopewell mounds. The Hopewell also had copper and iron celts and axes, some more fancy axes, and they even had daggers, swords, and scimitars. Now, you may have noticed this little symbol here on some of these weapons. There are many ancient artifacts here in North America with this symbol carved on them. They're often accused of being fake, but the Ojibwe tribe know this symbol. It is how they write the name of Creator. You read it from right to left, and it's pronounced yod Heva. There's a fourth syllable that they only write and speak once a year in their sacred lodges. But here's where it gets even more interesting. This symbol is cuneiform, which is a language that originated in the Middle East shortly after the Tower of Babel, which suggests to me that this symbol came over with the Jaredites, who left the Tower of Babel and were guided by God to this continent. And the Jaredite timeline matches up pretty close to the Adena timeline. Anyway, there are tens of thousands of artifacts that have been found ever since the Europeans arrived here in North America, especially the eastern half. 
that have ancient writings not only in cuneiform, but Hebrew, Egyptian, Assyrian, and Phoenician. And ever since the 1800s, whenever these artifacts have been found, they're always dismissed as fake by U.S. academia, even when they're found on official digs by the Smithsonian. And that's a very long story in and of itself, and sadly, I hate to say it, but even BYU jumps on this bandwagon. Now, some of you may have seen this before. It's known as the Anthon Transcript. This is supposedly the piece of paper that Joseph Smith gave to Martin Harris to take up to New York City to find a professor who could certify that these characters from the Book of Mormon were authentic Egyptian characters. Well, there's a tribe called the Micmac who live up around Maine and into Canada. Early colonists discovered that this tribe had a written language, and so they made a book called the Book of Prayers to give to their Micmac friends, which was written in their language. Look how similar some of the characters are between the Anthon transcript and the Micmac language, which is considered to be Heratic Egyptian. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are native tribes who know who the Hopewell were and that their ancestors destroyed them in war. Here's a list of sources I know of that talk about this. Now, obviously, there's differences among the stories, but the gist is that a war started at the Namesi Sipu, or the Fish River, or the Mississippi River. It was between the Hopewell, who were a lighter-skinned people, and the Delaware, also known as the Leni Lenape. Later, the Iroquois, also known as the Mengwi, joined up with the Delaware and other allies. They continued to drive the Hopewell eastward across their lands to New York, where most of the remaining Hopewell died, as archaeologists also confirmed to have happened around 400 AD. And the survivors fled southward along the Ohio River to Sandy Island, Kentucky, which sits in the Ohio River at the Falls of the Ohio. And that is where the last few survivors of the Hopewell were finished off. This is all very similar to what happens in Mormon chapters 1 through 8. A battle between the Nephites and Lamanites starts at the river Sidon near Zarahemla. And over the next 60 years, the Lamanites gradually drive the Nephites to the land of Cumorah in New York, where most of what's left of them are killed. And then sometime within the next 15 years, a few survivors escape to the south, but are hunted and destroyed by the Lamanites. Anyway, there's a lot more cool stuff to share, including stuff about... Atlantic Ocean migrations, Middle Eastern DNA, the destruction and natural disasters during the time of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, names that various tribes have for Jesus Christ. It just goes on and on. And to learn about this stuff more in depth, you can just watch my Book of Mormon Evidence video series that I've been slowly putting together over the last few years. But even that is just the tip of the iceberg of things that I've learned. Anyways, it's all very interesting to me. But the most important thing that these people left behind, we all have access to, whether you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or not. And it's called the Book of Mormon, which is more than just history and cool stories. It's one of the main tools that our Savior, Jesus Christ, has given in these latter days to help us change for the better and to enjoy an eternal life with Him, our Heavenly Father, and our family and friends which is what this life is all about. So I recommend you read it no matter what religion you belong to or if you don't belong to any religion at all. It's a book that will help you just get closer to Jesus Christ and become a better person in general.